Welcome, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, for surveying success, gathering OER usage data. The beginning of the session today will be recorded, and we are going to end the recording uh, when we go into the group discussion portion. So we want to start off by setting some ground rules for uh, today's session. So if you have any revisions or additions to these rules, please please feel free to pop them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, you can give me a thumbs up so we know we're all on board with these. So the ground rules are to be here now, avoid multitasking and, taking, and take advantage of this time to connect with colleagues, share airtime, allow everyone the opportunity to speak, foster mutual respect, use inclusive language, be mindful of power dynamics, whether they are social, professional, or otherwise, and how they might impact the conversation. And all ideas and questions are welcome. This is a space to learn and grow, which is a valuable, or excuse me, vulnerable process. It's also valuable too. <laughs> Assume others' positive intent and approach conversations with curiosity and openness. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to our agenda for today. So, um, the agenda is we're going to start here with our kind of our welcome. So um, it's kind of this part of the conversation. And then we're going to move into our contributor panel. So today we have three panelists, uh, Gabby Hernandez from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, Sonia Journey, University of New England, and Stephanie Buck, Oregon State University. So each of those uh, speakers will speak for about five minutes each or so. And then we're going to uh, divide up into breakout rooms uh, for small group discussion for about 15 minutes. And we're going to be dividing up in, by subject of interest, which we'll talk about when we get to that portion of the uh, program. And then we'll come back together for a community debrief uh, for 15 minutes after that. And then we'll close um, at the end. So um, I do also want to make sure I will talk about more about the format of the breakout rooms, but I do also want to note that there it is completely optional and we will have a quiet space reserved for those who would like to opt out of the discussion, but who would still like to come back and listen to the discussion afterwards. So before we get into our speaker panel, uh, we'll start with a brief mentee. So we're going to drop the link to that mentee in chat right now. All right. And if you have, if you're able to get into the mentee, you can click on the like button to let me know that you're here. <laughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and go into the um, question for the mentee. So it's a very, um, very simple question. So uh, we're curious to know what types of data do you collect related to your OER initiatives, if any? And I'm sure that probably we all collect some kind of data um, related to OER initiatives. But we're curious to hear um, what kinds of things that you're collecting um, and if you have any um, things that you would like to collect as well, um, you can include that. Okay, so we start off strong here with cost savings, uh, students impact, impacted, uh, faculty impacted, and course sections impacted. So we have cost savings and DFW or the um, grades of D, F, or withdraw. So then we have cost savings. So looks like we have cost savings pretty well represented here. Projected cost savings from grant applicants. So that's yeah, a little more specific um, population, planning to start collecting actual savings after projects are done, which is good. Good to have that follow up and close the loop. Uh, course class size, cost of books and savings faculty narratives about their projects. That's a really important qualitative um, piece of data to collect. Course offering follow-up, cost savings, students impacted, and percentage of sections using OER, student usage of OER textbooks. Okay, ROI on affordability initiatives, OER adoptions, library licensed materials used. That's really valuable too. Uh, number of faculty engaged in the program, number of students impacted. Okay, perfect. I don't want to spend too much more time on this so that we have enough time for our panel discussion. Um, but yeah, it looks like we're definitely collecting a lot of data, a lot of it related to um, students 
impacted uh, cost savings, faculty. All right, so you can feel free to continue um, answering that full question if you'd like. Um, but for now, we're gonna go ahead and go back into the slideshow. And I would like to introduce um, our first speaker. Uh, so Gabby, um, the Open Education Librarian at UT R RGV, would you like to go ahead and get started? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Gabby Hernandez, Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. We're all the way in Deep South Texas. And a little bit of um, background about our institution. We are, our institution, our enrollment is about 30,000 students. We are one of the largest Hispanic serving um, institutions in the nation. And we have um, affordability is key at our institution. Um, we're all about just affordability in general. So some of the data that I have been able to collect, I work with Airtable quite a bit. And with Airtable, I'm able to track lots and lots and lots of things. So I'm able, um, what I really wanted to do with it was if anybody sent me an email, I wanted to know if they have ever engaged in our program in one way or another. So that was like the idea behind it, um, really just tracking my customers or users. And so uh, what started as that simple idea turned into being able to track all of my data across all of the initiatives that, I, um, that I've worked with so far. And so uh, currently I have 972 records. So that's 972 individual faculty members that have engaged in our program in one way or another. And I'm also able to track um, <clears throat> engagement. So continued engagement if they you know, came because of this, um, you know, maybe they came to us because they had an OER request. And then I can see, okay, now they've applied for our grants. And maybe now that they've attended like a session that we've, you know, like a, like a professional development learning session, or maybe they've marked their course as zero or low cost. Um, so we're able to track that um, continued engagement with our faculty and our programs. And there is a template of the Airtable base that I use, the free version. And so you can go to the Airtable universe or use this link and it'll um, allow you to kind of just um, made it very simple. So like if you have grants or OER requests or overviews that you use, you can utilize this template on your own campus. Um, and it just gives you a place to start from scratch. So all the so you don't have to start from scratch and all the formulas are built in for you. So um, it's just kind of something to start if, if you want. Um, next slide. Another thing that we track at UTRGV is course marking. I am a Texas institution, so there is legislation um, regarding course marking. And so linked here on this slide, I have our course marking page. So you can see what that legislation is and how we designate zero cost and low cost. And with all of that information that we get from our faculty, um, we're able, so we, they have a form that they fill out and in that form, they can showcase uh, what types of materials they're using. So it's like, is it zero cost, low cost? If it's zero cost, what are you using? And they have three options. It's either, or, yeah, three options, which is they're using OER, they're using library licensed materials, or they don't have a textbook a, like in general, like they just don't need one or they use their slides or whatnot. And so when we receive that information from faculty, I'm able to do direct outreach to all the faculty who said they adopted OER. And it gives me the ability to kind of do a landscape analysis with my faculty without having them fill out another form. So it helps me understand, do my faculty actually understand what OER is? Because when we do that outreach, we say, hi, you said you adopted OER this semester. Can you please send me a link? We're collecting the adopted OER at UTRGV and providing them in a list for other faculty to use. So when they send me that link, I'm able to do a quick check to see like, do they know what OER is? And I'm happy to say that as the years have passed, they're getting better. And so this is um, a snapshot of some of the OER that has been reportedly adopted by UTRGV faculty. And so that's why I'm able to get this list um, from our faculty members. Next slide. And then with all of those things between the course marking and between um, Airtable, I'm able to create 
um, impact reports of our program. So some of the things that we have reported are like I was talking about faculty engagement. We were recently able to break down by percentage. So of all of those 972 faculty I had, how many of them belonged at e for each of our colleges. And then we took the institutional data of how many faculty are in each of those colleges and we had a percent um, engagement. So I, I really enjoyed that one to see, you know, instead of it being like liberal arts is huge because liberal arts is generally the largest, um, has the most number of faculty, we were really able to break it down by percentage of engagement. And then of course, other things that we uh, track are the return on investment for our um, funded library funded grants or institutional funded grants for OER, as well as the, the small purchasing fund that we have for unlimited user licensed ebooks, which is a different outreach that we run. It's not OER, but still that affordability, you know, conversation and how can we reduce costs for our students. Um, and then I'm also able to track course marking. And then, um, of course, that, you know, boils down to how it, what's our total savings and our students impacted. And then any student that goes through one of our adoption grants, um, we give, we have them answer feedback survey. And so I'm able to also collect some of that information and really tell our students stories of what our students think about utilizing OER or maybe wanting to use more OER in their courses. Um, so I think that's my time, but if anybody has questions about any of these initiatives, I'm always happy to speak more. And that's what I have. All right, thanks so much, Gabby. All right, so we'll go ahead and turn up now to Sonia. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sonia Derny, and I'm a scholarly communication librarian at the University of Maine. I'm sorry, University of New England in Maine. I don't even know the name of the school I work at today. Um, we have about 7,000 students here. And it was really helpful for me to hear Gabby's presentation. I pulled up how many folks we have in our database. You have a ton of faculty that you're connected with, Gabby. We currently have 40 faculty um, enrolled in our OEN dashboard that we're tracking. So I'm um, coming to you all today from the different end of the spectrum, being a little bit more of a newbie to OER, um, both myself and our university. Um, I will share that one of the great benefits of being a little bit late to the game is we get to learn from all of the great work everyone else is doing. So that's been a huge perk of being a little bit late to the game. So um, the University of New England um, joined the Open Education Network about a year ago. Um, our goals were to um, join this community for networking reasons, to connect with the professional development op opportunities, and also really to be able to use the OEN dashboard. So th those were our big goals. Um, around the same time we opened, we have we did some grassroots efforts on campus to start gathering some data. So in 2023, we did a faculty survey um, so, so that we could get sort of a current snapshot of OEN, OER adoption on campus. We got buy-in from all of the college deans, so we were able to push that out to faculty that way. We had 125 responses, and the responses were anonymous. But we did give people the opportunity to identify themselves if they were willing to be an OER champion or if they were looking to learn more about OER, because then I really targeted those people for upcoming workshops and things like I would send them out to the entire community, but also target those folks who specifically said they wanted to learn more. Um, so the piece in identifying the potential OER champions was really helpful. Um, once we had access to the OEN dashboard, I was able to take those names of the people that I knew were using OER on campus and manually add them to the dashboard. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we learned in our survey. Next slide, please. So basically, you can see here that we have a lot of folks on campus who aren't aware of open textbooks or they've heard of them and didn't know too much. So this told us that we really have a lot of opportunity here at UNE to um, talk more and do some education on campus. Next slide, please. We also asked, we asked a lot of questions and I'm happy to share the survey with anyone if anyone else is sort of just starting out as we are. Um, we asked a bunch of questions, and this was one of the other ones, is how much faculty um, 
understand that their students are paying for their course. And I'm sharing this one because I found it sort of concerning the high number of folks. You'll see that gold bar all the way to the right. We had a pretty fair amount of folks who weren't even sure how much their students were paying, which um, seems odd to me for faculty not to know, not to like put down faculty, but that, that was a concerning number to me to see how many folks like had were not sure how much students were paying for textbooks. Next slide, please. And we got, we asked like, like um, what barriers were to the people who were familiar with OER but not using them. We asked what barriers they were facing and it was very much so in line with common misconceptions. There are no quality OER in my discipline. Cheap is not always the way to go. Copyright's too difficult. My students don't actually pay that much for textbooks. Um, I don't have time and that OER are bad for the publishing industry. So this is very much in alignment with what I'm sure you all are all hearing for also common OER misconceptions. Next slide, please. And um, so when I say we did things here on campus grassroots to gather some data, like we really did things grassroots. We have um, chalkboards. We have two campuses, uh, two campus libraries. And we have chalkboards in each of them. So we literally um, put up questions on the chalkboard to ask students how much they spend on textbooks um, that semester. And we asked um, if students have ever not purchased a textbook because it was too expensive. And in the two years we did this, we found that 90 something percent of the students had not purchased a textbook based on the price. So that was concerning to us, obviously, right off the bat. And then when we asked about um, how, where people find their textbooks, you know, we learned that a lot of students were downloading them illegally or pirating them um, in addition to getting them at the bookstore in other legit ways. So um, none of this data that we gathered was super unexpected. This is what we were sort of expecting when we surveyed, but this was really helpful to us because then we had the data to put together to um, apply for a grant, which we were able to do. So we used this data, put together a grant application, and were able to receive $80,000 for a three-year grant to um, do some grants for adoption, modification, and creation for some professional development on campus to bring speakers from the Open Education Network to campus this summer, which was really fantastic because um, uh, my colleagues and I at the library have been talking to faculty till we're blue in the face about how wonderful OER are. Um, but to have other outside experts come in and share that same message really resonated with faculty. So we have all of this data. Um, we got the grant and then we were really excited to start using the dashboard. So next slide, please. Um, and then one of the things I found was that I really only had the names of the people who had filled out the survey and indicated that they're using OER and willing to sort of talk with other folks about it for the OEN dashboard. We um, didn't have any other names in there. I didn't have a large database of people to draw from. So this is when, I'm sorry, I keep using the word grassroots, but this is um, pretty much as on the ground as you can get, is I literally made a QR code that went to a three question survey, which was, are you using OER? Yes or no? What's your name and what's your email address? Because then this clearly isn't ideal, but we had to start from somewhere. So I then took that QR code and put it up on every screen we have around campus, sent it out via email, sent the link, and got as many people as I could to fill this out. So then I was able to manually add those other 40 or so um, OER users from our faculty to get them into the dashboard. So currently we know we haven't captured all of the OER usage on campus, but what we have been able to find is that the cost and savings has gone, student savings has gone up over the years um, since we've started doing this over the last two years or so, and we have data that we can keep building on. So um, again, we're really in a different place than Gabby, but I'm really thankful to have that OEN data dashboard to be able to keep tracking it as we move forward. And now, of course, we're using the OEN dashboard when we set up workshops. That's how people RSVP and we get them right into the system. So there's none of this like QR business and me manually entering them. But we had to start somewhere and that's where we started. And having that dashboard has been such a helpful tool to be able to like, you know, share those reports out to the provost and to department heads 
and things like that. Um, next slide, please. And so um, we also, so that was all um, surveying that we did on campus here with the UNE community. We have recently started a statewide OER group under the umbrella of the Maine Library Association. And we are working to put together a statewide survey of students. And we basically are going to be um, modeling it on the Pennsylvania survey. So I've included some links here on the slides in case people wanna go ahead and take a look at any of those surveys if you're interested in looking at things statewide. We're hoping that um, you know with our campus data, we were able to apply for grants within our college. So we're hoping with more statewide data, we might be able to get some more funding either through our state library association or have some some sort of impact on um, legislation in the state. So um, that's what's going on here at the University of New England. All right, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thanks so much, Sonia. And now I'll turn it over to Stephanie. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie Buck. I'm the Director of Open Educational Resources at Oregon State University. I am bucking the trend. There are no slides because it's been done. So, um, also, I'm the third speaker, and I don't know that I have a ton of stuff to add, because I think we're doing a lot of the same kinds of things, which is awesome. Um, the more we do that, the more we share, the better. Um, let me just give you a little background on Oregon State. Um, we are a land-grant institution. We have about 30,000 students. Uh, we have a very large online cohort, um, and we are... Not, I would say, so much, you know, an, a, like a, an institutional guide to say, oh, we must think about affordability. We don't really have that sort of institutional top level. It's more, again, like many other people here, a little more grassroots. So my unit is the Open Educational Resources Unit. And weirdly, we are not in the library. We are in the Division of Educational Ventures, which means nothing to anyone. But basically, it used to be online teaching and learning, uh, all the eCampus programs, and then they changed us to a division, which, whatever. It's not that important, but we are not, in, we are actually physically in the library, but we're not funded by the library. We actually have our own little separate budget that we get from the Division of Educational Ventures. And it's a, it's, it's just the way we evolved. Um, I don't think it's necessarily better or worse than being in the library. Um, Oregon, like many other states, has some legislation that requires us to do certain things. And so one of those is, of course, we need to add the no cost, low cost designations to the course schedule um, so that the students can, at the time of registration, know what their course material spendings are going to be. That was uh, House Bill 2871. Um, we were also, that which uh, passed in 2015, we were also required by in 2019 to create a text for textbook affordability plan, um, which has been an interesting experience um, since it was required of us by the Higher Education Coordinating Commission. So we were all diligent and shared and did and created, and, and we've gotten no response from heck whatsoever about is this what you want or not what you want? So it's a little, it's a little strange, but it was good. It was a good exercise. It got, got people to meet together with other about why this is important. Um, the way this works at OSU is um, in the schedule of classes, there's a low cost or no cost designation. And that is automatically generated when the faculty submit their course materials requests to the bookstore um, that tracks that and creates a report that I can use. And then I took that information and I used um, Looker Studio to create a dashboard which I will pop into the chat. It's not real super pretty right now. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna re revise it, but there it is. Um, and what that does, that, that tracks a lot of the similar information to what um, my colleagues were talking about. Um, we look at how much students have saved. We prefer to use the term cost avoidance, but then faculty get confused by that. But you, you all know what I mean, right? This is not money that the students necessarily can put back into their savings account. It's just they never had to spend it in the first place. Uh, how many students are enrolled in low and no cost sections? Um, we can 
parse this by academic year and term and by college and all that by campus. We have a, a number of campuses. Um, so we can we can track all of that information. And I take all of that from the spread from the spreadsheet that I get from uh, the registrar's office and I just upload it into this um, so basically a huge Google Excel spreadsheet at this point. This was um, something that I really wanted to do because when I took over this position in 2019, we didn't have really any data tracking going on. It was very limited. And so I wanted to be able to point my supervisors, other faculty, administrators to say, here, look, look how much money we have saved and isn't this awesome? So the dashboard was a big thing. And, and I know there are several institutions that have created these kinds of dashboards like Gabby and, and other folks too. Um, highly recommended because it does give you like a nice view of what's going on and you can share this with people and say, look, uh, this past summer, 60% of our courses were no cost or low cost. Are we not awesome? So that's one of the things that we we track. Certainly um, savings and, and number of courses and um, that kind of stuff. A um, couple of other things that we've done um, is we have data dashboards attached to each of our individual textbooks that we publish. We use Pressbooks platform. And my assistant director, Mark, is the genius behind this. Basically, what he used it was also um, Looker Studio. And so faculty can see how often their textbooks are viewed, downloaded, where more or less people are coming from. We try to respect people's privacy so we don't get too detailed on that. But you can look at any of our textbooks, and it's going to have a data dashboard on it. Faculty freaking love it um, because it tells them that they're being, you know, used. Uh, it has a little map on it, and so there's little orange dot, orange, we're, we're orange and black, we're beavers, right? Got to have orange little dots everywhere that shows them all over the world where they, you know, where people are coming from. Love it. Um, so we did that, and so we use that information fairly regularly to also share. Um, we share it with the faculty. We share it with the with the administration. Um, so that was. Those are the. Two main data dashboards that we have is the, the big one that tracks savings and student numbers, enrollment, and things like that. And then we have those for individual textbooks that say, here's how often it's been downloaded, viewed, that kind of thing. And then recently, we added an adoption form to our, uh, o our OER textbooks. Again, it's in uh, Pressbooks. Um, it's a little button that says, adopt. Um, and somebody can click on that and fill in a little, it's just a Google form. It's not, not anything fancy. Um, when we did that in March of this year, and we have already tracked over 80 adoptions of our textbooks, which is pretty freaking cool. I'm not going to mention any names, but, you know, Harvard, Oxford, they're adopting our textbooks. Um, and faculty again love it, um, and it has it, ha it and it it's 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 a different kind of impact than you know student success or student retention or, or those kinds of things which are all super important, um, but it shows that people appreciate the quality of the textbooks that we're putting out because they're willing to adopt and and we all know that faculty are very concerned about quality of textbooks so having that has been really fun and just another. Just another way of viewing the information. Um, so we shared that with the administration and the provost was super happy and like, yay, okay, we're awesome. We love that. So if you don't have an adoption form, I would recommend adding one. It's, you know, just a link, click to it, fill it in. It's obviously not perfect because not every, it's voluntary, but still when you can say, hey, we've had 80 adoptions since March, you know, that kind of, these are the things that are impactful. Um, like many other institutions, we have run the ever popular Florida virtual survey uh, on our campus. We tweeted, we adapted it obviously a little bit for us. We did that in 2022. And we have a report out that I can throw into the chat as well that we did. Um, we found that 61% of our respondents said that they do not purchase their textbooks because of cost. Um, we also found that um, based on 
uh, it was a, not the biggest response pool of respondents, but still we found that um, students who are in historically underrepresented groups, uh, students maybe who are Pell eligible grant or in, in groups that are historically under uh, underserved or whatever, do benefit from having OERs uh, in their courses. This survey has been super helpful to me because I can go to faculty and I can say, this is what's happening at OSU. I can share those stories. We have information about that on our website. Um, I, 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 it's been super helpful. And so we're gonna run it again next year, 2025, isn't it? Yeah, that's next year, right? Um, I'm gonna run it again. We're gonna tweak it a little bit. I've been working with some colleagues at other Oregon institutions who are also gonna run the survey. Um, but having local data is is extremely helpful and very um, telling to the faculty because if you you know you're all saying oh well Florida did this or you know Michigan did this or something like that they're like yeah that's great that's not our institution that, you know what's happening here so I I highly recommend that happy to share our survey uh, it's in Qualtrics if you have Qualtrics I can just download it as a QSR you can upload it run it do whatever you want to do based on a variety of other people's surveys. But hey, that's what OER is all about. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, yay. So um, yeah, those are kinds of the things that we, we've we been tracking. Um, how difficult is it to get permission to survey your students that frequently? Um, it's, it, well, we have to go through IRB. Um, so that's what I'm doing right now. Um, it's not that difficult to get the permissions. Um, I just sort of do it. it. The the difficulty is when to run it so that there aren't a lot of competing surveys. So I have to be kind of careful about what I choose. Ecampus puts out a survey or sorry, the division puts out a survey in, in the spring. So we're probably gonna run it in the winter. Um, so far, we haven't had any any pushback from from IRB or anybody about the survey. But it has it is tricky uh, to know when to do it so that you get the best response rate because it, that that really does um, impact you know what what information you can you can pull. Um, so that's a little bit about what's happening at OSU. Um, future plans. I hope that we will be able to do more with extracting from the deck bookstore data, which which courses are actually using OERs and which are actually just no cost. Hey, I'm using library materials, those kinds of things. We uh, They just implemented a new system that should help with that, because I think that kind of granularity um, is important. And then um, we do have faculty who will do uh, you know feedback from their students at the end of the term. You know, How'd you like the textbook? Would it work? Uh, we probably need to do more of that, a little more, more consistently. So I'm working on that as well. And that is Oregon State. Thank you. Well, thank you that so was, much. That was fun listening to me just chat for <laughs> 10 minutes without any uh, slides, I know. <laughs> no, it was great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was awesome. And thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their experiences.